Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Thank you so much for joining us in this next hour. I'm Sherry Hubert, Associate Dean of Admissions here at Fuqua School of Business, and I'm joined by my wonderful colleagues and um, a hugely fantastic panel um, that will engage with you over the next hour. Really, the purpose of this session, and it's new for us, is to allow you to see the individuals and the leadership team that you'll engage with throughout your two-year journey with us and the transform transformative experience that you're going to have and how each of our departments play a role in that journey. So what we'll do is um, we will take the next hour. I will introduce each of the panelists, give you a little bit about what they're going to talk about. They, in turn, will share information with you. You'll also get a chance to see how we just have fun with each other, right? Team Fuqua is all about not just students, but staff, faculty, alumni as well. So we really wanted to have an opportunity for you to see our ability to engage and how we really love our jobs. So we'll have a conversation, a dialogue. It'll be very informal. We, it's open. Um, we want to make sure that you have time to ask questions. So start to think about the questions that you might want to ask us. I'll you know, chat those, text those into the chat box. And then I'll save that at the end and navigate questions during the Q&A portion. But let's, um, to get things started, I want to at least give you a sense of who's on the panel. I'm very excited. Uh, we actually have our esteemed dean, Bill Bolding, joining us. And he'll talk a little bit about uh, the vision, his vision, what's innovative and what's new happening at Fuqua. We'll then turn it over to Russ Morgan, who are here at the end. Russ, Russ is our Senior Associate Dean of Full-Time Programs and my boss, so be nice. He'll talk <laughs> a little bit about what's happening in terms of the daytime MBA curriculum and the enhancements that we have, and actually that you'll have an opportunity to experience as the first class that will be a part of that new enhancement, followed by my colleagues, Steve Mizoraka, who's right there next to Russ, uh, Steve actually is our Team Fuqua Spirit <laughs> champion, as you can see uh, from his paraphernalia. And he will talk a little bit about demystifying Team Fuqua. We know a lot of people have a question about what does it really mean? Is it true? Is it real? This is the guy to let you know <laughs> all about it. And then finally, um, we will have uh, wrapped up by Cheryl Dirks, who's another wonderful colleague. And Cheryl really has been with the school for many years and can give you a sense of um, the types of support that the Career Management Center provides. She's the Associate Dean of our Career Management Center. And really, talk, we'll talk a little bit about the landscape of the careers and industry and how things have changed and how we'll support you throughout that journey as well. All righty, so start to think about your questions. Once you have them, text them into the chat box. Like I said, we'll save time at the end. But to get started, it's interesting, Bill, you and I just got back from um, Asia. So Bill and I just did a whole tour in Southeast Asia called Duke Doing Business Better. And it really is about how is business a really force and driver for change and impact, positive societal impact, and how can it be that force for positive change? So maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, how do you think about Fuqua and it's in, in light of the challenges that are happening in both business and society today, how are we poised to be able to build and develop the types of leaders that are needed in today's environment? Okay, well, thank you, Sherry. And thank you all for joining us in, in virtual space. Uh, and thank you for checking out what I think is a very special community. Uh, this, is a, this is a challenging time in the world and in the world of business in terms of being able to get people to act with common purpose and to uh, advance the common good. We believe that business provides this incredible platform for positive change in the world. And therefore, with that opportunity to drive that positive change comes to us an obligation to provide the kind of talent and the, the insights in order to use business as a force for, for good, as a force for positive change. But there are some realities that you have to deal with in terms of being able to live up to that potential. And one reality is that we're living in a moment in time where we're seeing increasing polarization rather than an increasing sense of common purpose. And so what that means is that we need to identify and develop the kind of leadership capability that can bring people together to get them to do things that really will make a positive difference in the world. We don't think that that's something that is trivial. Uh, it's not easy to do. It requires some particular capabilities. And in, in fact, we talk uh, all the time about triple threat capabilities that are needed um, to produce the kind of leadership capability that will advance organizations and advance society. So the first thing 
is pretty obvious. This has been known in business schools for many, many years, which is you have to be smart to understand and navigate the complexities of the world we live in. You have to have a high IQ in order to understand, analyze, dissect, diagnose, and act on the opportunities that are in front of you. And people don't want to follow someone who lacks that capability. They may follow that individual once, but not likely twice if they lead you off the cliff. So IQ is, is profoundly important, um, but it's not the end of the story. Uh, Sherry's al already mentioned this idea of Team Fuqua. We, we have a deep-seated belief that a team is just profoundly important, and it's profoundly important because a great team will always be a great individual. And so it's not enough to be the smartest person in the room and tell everyone else what to do um, when that essentially suppresses the talent and the ideas and the capabilities that exist among others. And so um, here we believe that in addition to IQ, that you need EQ or emotional intelligence. You, if you're going to be great on a team, you have to be able to relate to and connect with others. And without the emotional intelligence to do so, uh, it's going to be very hard to create a high-performing team. And so EQ is, is, again, a requirement in terms of underlying capability. The challenge is that as you look across the options that, that you'll surely have as you, as you identify different business schools, every top business school is focused on IQ. I think some of them are paying attention to EQ because they understand the shift in, in how people work and how they can work more effectively. But here's the thing, is that people with high IQ and high EQ may not be the kind of people that you want to work with. You may not want to work with those people because someone with high EQ could be fundamentally manipulative. They could get you to do things that are for their own selfish self-interest as opposed to what's best for the team, what's best for the organization. And so even though IQ and EQ are required, they're necessary, they're not sufficient. The third thing we believe you must have to be the kind of leader in a world that is so polarized, in a world that is, has so many fractures, so many fault lines, to bring people together to act with common purpose, is you need to have high DQ. And when I say DQ, I'm not talking about Dairy Queen, I am talking about a decency quotient. And so decency quotient means that essentially you care about other people. You want them to be their best, to bring out their best, to make them successful. We have a saying here that uh, uh, around the idea of supportive ambition, that your success is my success. And it fundamentally is about understanding that leadership is being selfless and serving others rather than being selfish and lining your own pockets, creating your own empire, and essentially only caring about your, your kind of short-sighted uh, selfish interests. So those are the capabilities that we think provide a platform uh, for bringing people together to do something great. And we think this is critically important at this moment in time in a world where there is so much opportunity, where business historically has done so much, and yet people, this is a reality check, people are questioning the value of business in society. And therefore, in order to kind of answer those questions in a positive way, we have to have the kind of leadership capability that will inspire trust, inspire confidence, inspire credibility, and be the kind of people that others want to work with, work for, in order to do something that is profoundly important. And so leadership capability simply permeates everything that we do and everything we think about. But there are some other challenges that I think are highly relevant in terms of the world we live in. One of the things that is just completely reshaping companies in every kind of industry sector around the world is the role of technology. And thinking through what happens as we move into a world of big data, as we move into worlds where machines can replace people, where we can automate processes, where we can use machine learning and artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. And this is an opportunity to create new value, to improve people's lives, but it's also a risky time when people may again question, what is the role of business? Is it to eliminate my job or is it to improve the quality of my life? And as we think about what we outsource to technology, are we outsourcing human judgment? Are we outsourcing 
the human difference in the way we use technology. And so we need thoughtful leaders who can harness technology, understand the role of technology, and the opportunities that it presents to transform lives and to improve lives and to make society better. And so that is a particular challenge that I think is highly relevant uh, for leaders today. Third thing is, increasingly, we realize whether you're working in a big company or you want to start a new company, is that we need people with an entrepreneurial mindset. And most simply stated, what this means is we need people who are owners. They own the problems that they face. They own the outcomes that they create. And they have a sense of, I'm not just renting this position for the moment, and I'm going to pass on the, the problems and, and opportunities to someone else, that I'm going to own it, I'm going to make a difference, and therefore I will be committed and invested in the kind of transformation that's necessary that really only comes with an ownership mentality. And so these are three big themes that I think you're seeing uh, evidenced in the world of business, all around the world, in every kind of industry sector, and where we need talent in order to make a difference in the lives of other people. So it is a time of wonderful opportunity. I think it's a time, despite the negative publicity around business leadership and the role of business in society, it is a moment in time when we have the opportunity to show people how we can, how we can do things the right way and how we can make our organizations better while doing what's best. And with that, I will stop and let others <laughs> weigh in. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bill. Your words are always so inspiring. I think now this is a great setup to then transition to Russ. And Russ, first of all, I want you to share with them your unique uh, relationship with Fuqua and Duke University and how that's really influenced your role as Senior Associate Dean of Full-Time Programs. And then on the heels of what Bill has mentioned in terms of uh, vision and, and what types of leaders we want to um, develop here, can you talk in a bit more detail about what that's going to look like for students out there who come into the program next year? Sure, sure. So I, I think the first part of that, Sherry, uh, was suggesting that I warn you that I'm incredibly biased. I, uh, <laughs> I, I love this place. I have uh, three degrees from Duke, um, including two from Fuqua. And so I was uh, an undergraduate here in economics, um, got an MBA, and then uh, came back and, uh, and got my PhD, and then back here about a decade as part of the marketing faculty and in um, and, and, and leadership here. And so um, a, a fun fact related to that is my core marketing faculty member is also up here, and it was Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Some, somehow I was allowed to continue in this. Somehow, <laughs> somehow, <laughs> somehow he overcame. Right. So. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yes. So, so th this place is special to me, and um, you'll hear from a number of people here, including Steve, in just a little bit. Um, we have a lot of alums who, who find a way back to, to work work with us and sometimes for us. And so um, this is a meaningful place to me. Um, Bill did a, a great setup, I think, in terms of where we're headed with the, the curriculum. And so hopefully um, you, you, you have a slide up there as I'm talking. And uh, just want a little bit, spend a little bit of time talking about, um, as Bill talked about, what our vision is in terms of how we develop leaders and how we develop um, people who come through Fuqua, um, we, we do have um, a, an idea of what we want to do and, and, and what we want to create and the, the experience we want students to have. And so we've recently um, had faculty working on uh, a new curriculum. And so our curriculum served us unbelievably well. And you'll hear from Steve in just a little bit. He actually experienced uh, a lot of this curriculum as a, a student here. Uh, but it served us really well, but we see an opportunity. And so the, the world of business is really dynamic right now. And so a lot of our stakeholders um, uh, we've talked to, Bill's talked to a number of them, we've talked to our students. And um, we, we've really thought deeply about this experience and these three pillars that, that Bill talked about. Um, how do we turn those into, into courses for you? And so, so what we've done is to, to really think through, um, when you start the program, how do we lay a foundation for you to begin to develop as a leader along these themes? And have you be as successful as possible as you go through getting your MBA? And so the, the first part of this um, gets to this theme of common purpose that, that Bill brought up. And so this idea that we, we have an increasingly divided world and polarized world. And, what that can, can do is, is pull people apart as opposed to bring them together. And so how do we bring people together 
to be more effective in terms of how they interact with each other um, and the, the results that they get for the teams that they work on uh, and the organizations they work for. And so what we have when you start out is a, a class that we're, um, we're doing a little bit of re-engineering around. It already included a lot of the themes around common purpose, and that's our leadership ethics and organization course, or LEO as we call it. And so one of the first courses you take will get you into, into having some of these discussions and practicing how you have a dialogue when you, you do come from, from different positions. And we think that's critically important, that we have an open environment that, that introduces those conversations. In some of the conversations we've had with students, um, we realize that although it's, it's critically important to have these conversations very early, there's also um, a little bit of sorting that's going on. You're beginning to learn who your classmates are, who your teammates are. And so we realize there's only so far we can push that in that first summer term. Uh, but all the feedback we got is that it would be fantastic to return to these themes as you wrap up your first year. And so before you go out on an internship, uh, we have this course um, in, in um, business and common purpose um, in a divided world. And so um, the idea there is that you've got great comfort in terms of who you are at this point, what the business school experience is, what leader development looks like, and that you can have courageous conversations. Uh, you can speak um, about uh, kind of your positions on things without uh, feeling like you're going to be judged. And so we feel really, really good about the pair of those, the book into courses that we have around that. Um, Bill also mentioned this idea of um, the importance of being able to think like an entrepreneur. And we certainly don't expect that everybody that comes through here is going to do a startup when they graduate. But we do think having a mindset or mentality where um, you begin to think like an entrepreneur, you begin to think like an owner, um, and then just uh, have kind of a, a vision over your lifetime what it means to think entrepreneurially. A lot of our graduates um, come back to entrepreneurship, come back to startups a little bit later uh, in their careers. And so we want to lay a foundation where everyone is introduced to that in the first term that we have. And then we've also paired that um, with, with a, another course that we have, uh, the technology-driven transformation of business. And I think Bill set it up very well in terms of how do we begin to think about um, the opportunities that, that come with technology, but also it feels a little bit at times that it can be a threat. And so how do we, how do we leverage technology in a way that improves the lives of, of everyone as opposed to becomes a threat and feels displacing? And so we think it's a big opportunity now to begin to start the conversation around what is the role of technology in business. And for, for all of these, and in particular with the entrepreneurship and with uh, the technology uh, class, we want to introduce everyone. We want to provide that foundation. But what we're also planning to doing is, is providing a roadmap. And so we've got a lot of coursework as you go through the curriculum. And we've got a great deal of elective content and availability and opportunity for you as you not only finish your first year, but entire elective slate in your second year where you can begin to pick up these themes again. And so what we're doing is beginning to provide you a roadmap of, of where you can take these themes. And then the, the last course I wanted to briefly talk about is um, we've had a pair of courses on consequential leadership, uh, C-Lead 1 in that first summer when you come in and C-Lead 2 in the second summer when you return from your internship. And as we've looked at those, um, we've seen an opportunity to, to do a couple of things. One is, um, is to signal to you that, that your leader development is not just the summer of your first year and summer of your second year when you return, but this really is a continuous developmental journey. And we've added a lot of content um, throughout the year and throughout the experience. And so what we're doing with those courses is, is um, combining them and then extending them to be a more end-to-end -end experience where you are um, on a track and you've got, again, another roadmap for your leader development that clearly starts the minute you get here and um, it doesn't end uh, when, you, when you graduate, but uh, we sort of wrap up kind of the academic elements of it when you graduate and just to, to, to revise that in a way that makes it a little bit more of a continuous journey. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Russ. So that gives you a good overview of what you have to look forward to from a curricular perspective. You know, as we know, part of the journey is not just about the academics, but it really is about the um, the co-curricular, the community, right? What is it? What, what's your day-to-day -day going to be like? And so, I can't think of a better person 
to talk to us about that community than Steve Mizoraka, who's the assistant dean of the daytime MBA program. So he's basically going to be your daytime MBA dean. He also um, oversees our master's in management studies program. And he literally wears Duke Blue or logo <laughs> clothing every single day. Easy to shop for him. Easy to shop yeah. for him. Yeah. <laughs> you have stock in like the Duke bookstore. I mean, really. Yeah. Um, so you got to love it. So anyway, Steve, can you demystify and break down what is Team Fuqua? What are our pair of principles? How, do, how will that manifest itself for the folks out there when they get here? Yeah. Thanks, Sherry. <clears throat> I, I do have to say it's, it's a privilege to speak with you all. It's a little bit new for me to be in a room with our multimedia team and not with you, uh, yeah. speaking with you. But it is a, a privilege to share a panel with colleagues that, that mean a lot to me. Um, Duke and Fuqua, like, like Russ and really all of us, has given us some of the best things in our lives. And not just for the next year, but for the next 50 years. I'd love to be uh, part of this special community. And so it, it is really a privilege that my team and I get to support students uh, on your journey and, and we're here for you. I, I can relate um, 13 years ago as a prospective student, um, the nerves, the, the anxiety, the excitement, some of the hope of what it would be like to join a special community. And, and I hope you do get to meet us. I hope you get to spend some time with us. And so um, Team Fuqua and the Fuqua family is real. Um, I wish I could bottle it up. I don't know that my words would, would do it justice. Um, many of you have interacted with alumni or current students in the process so far. If you haven't, I encourage you to do so. Uh, in the cities around the world where you are, um, our alumni love Duke, they love Fuqua, they're, they're excited to share their experience. So don't just listen to us, talk to our family. Um, they can be the best advocates for what this experience is really like. And there is a special sauce. So for me, Sherry, Team Fuqua is the way that we live. And on the screen, you'll see a number of words. Let me just start with authentic engagement, one of our paired principles. I love that admissions asks you all to write a 25 randoms things essay, <laughs> right? So Team Fuqua starts with you. Okay, it's you bringing your authentic self to this community to belong. Um, the unique passions, backgrounds, interests, talents, voice that you have, um, that's the bedrock for what makes this place so special. And it's, I imagine, fun to read. I've read a number of those essays over time. Um, but we want to get to know you. We want to know what you will do, how you will uplift the experience of your classmates, how you will support your classmates and their ambition, um, how you will call out different voices within the community. And you know, there's a ton of blogs on our website that talk about each of these paired principles and, and how we come together. This idea that we are in a special community, right? So this idea of of impactful stewardship. Um, a fun fact and a call out to Durham is that we're one of the few places, the only place in the world that has a top 10 business school and a top 10 place to live. Um, Durham is my home, will be my home. I hope for many of you it will become your home. Um, uh, and then doing this experience with integrity. And so rather than just have a number of words on the screen, if we could just advance the next, next slide. Um, these are a set of stories that we think of. Um, and this is the only installation that we have uh, in our hallway. Um, recognizing and celebrating our paired principles. Um, and for us, um, they are a set of experiences that our students truly buy in and uplift and support their classmates. And that happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we have a very robust academic curriculum. Interwoven into that is a uh, very intense and emotional and fulfilling job search, um, um, but a very strong co-curricular experience. Uh, we have many student clubs. Um, our students are always doing something. Um, just in this last week, our students camped out for Duke basketball tickets with graduate students. Um, you can look on our social media channels to see some pictures of that. Um, on Friday, they will pack 55,000 meals for, um, for uh, Rise Against Hunger for those that, that are maybe not as fortunate as we are. Just last week, we voted our sexual representatives for our first years. We truly have this partnership with our students, and that's the trust that I love and the amount that I learn. Um, is often from those conversations with our students and their reps. So the first years right now, a month and a half into the program, are selecting their leadership. And that, that is part of their journey. Um, uh, every day there's something special. Today is Wednesday. We generally don't have classes on Wednesday. Our students are going to career intensives, learning from alumni that are coming back. Um, it's surprising to me to see how much folks love to come back. And so if I could just kind of end on this slide, and, and certainly more than happy to, to take any <laughs> questions you have. I thought about reading my definitions of our paired principles. I thought about um, maybe even a brief little lecture. But to me, what's so powerful about this image, this is an image of our students at orientation uh, that happened a little over a month ago. When I look at this image, I see and am reminded by and reflect on the energy, the excitement, the love our students feel to be part of this really special community. And you can see in the background, there's six different sections. Um, 
represented by each different color. But to me, the, the part that is truly special, and this why this is one of my favorite pictures, is the folks in the blue in the front. Those are our second year students. They come back in the middle of the summer. Our, our program starts earlier than most. And at times during the peak of their internship, perhaps even the week before or after their main deliverable is due. And they are here to partner with us in launching the first year class. This is the group of mentors that we have the luxury of being with to support our students on this journey. And the fact that these students selflessly wanted to come back and were committed to helping each other, um, it gets the first years off on the right foot. It energizes and inspires our staff. Um, and it creates a culture that is, that is truly special and unique. And so I could talk for hours. i have already over my five minute limit. Um, I could talk for hours to give you story after story. Um, happy to reach out anytime. Um, Please engage with our alums. I'm happy to talk with you and our questions. And I look forward to hopefully meeting you soon. See, didn't I tell you he was a good person? <laughs> to really give you a sense of what this culture yeah. is about. Um, so now, Cheryl, yes. you're going to bring it on home for us. I'll try. And, and it's very fitting, right? So you are, you and your team, you're the ones who bring, the, bring these students home, yeah. right, at the end of their two year journey. Yeah. And you've done it for many years. So maybe can you share what makes this? what makes what you do so special, and then how you've seen over time the landscape change, and then how has the Career Center continued to support students over their, the lifetime Absolutely. Their careers? Okay, well, great. Mm -hmm. um, like everyone said, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you virtually uh, today. And um, kind of like, uh, Fuqua is a very special place um, to me as well. Um, I celebrated my 20 year anniversary here this year um, and, and certainly um, have enjoyed every year and have enjoyed seeing Fuqua grow. And I think, I think for me, one of the reasons it continues to be just a fascinating experience um, to work with students and to celebrate with them as they, achieve, as they achieve their career goals is because it really does bring together all of the things that you've heard about here um, from the vision um, that, that Bill articulated that obviously has continued to grow and continue to change as the world changes. Um, and the curriculum to make sure that students are learning and transforming to be relevant in today's world and the community experience that we that we want and need students to be a part of and then obviously they personalize that experience to what they want um, to getting out of the career process and so it really brings together everything that Fuqua is into the individual goals and interests of each student and so that's what we love about the career process and so um, I came from an admissions background so I have a special appreciation um, for the questions that you might have I also was a trailing spouse uh, when we moved here many years ago from Chicago. And so for those of you who are considering the, the business school experience um, with a partner, I, I have a special fondness for, for what that, that two-person decision um, looks like as well. And so happy to answer any questions about it from that perspective too. Um, so I really just want to briefly address kind of uh, the job market um, at a very high level. Uh, there was a, a survey that came out recently um, where a, a professional organization of the MBA career space uh, surveyed a number of employers. And there were a couple of points that came out in that survey that I think are really important um, given the space that you are in right now, considering the business school experience, that, that the, the job market is extremely robust right now and that companies with job opportunities really are thinking not only about on-campus recruiting as a venue for hiring great talent uh, for their organizations, but are increasingly looking to virtual recruiting options. There's an enormous increase in companies looking at virtual recruiting options as a way to identify talent. And they're also looking to other alternative recruiting channels, such as some of the national conferences that some of our students attend, as well as even just simple uh, recruiting channels like job postings. And so what that does is it diversifies um, the sources that our students look at for jobs, which is great because it means there's, there's different ways that students can identify job sources, but it also means you really need to keep your eyes open on all of the different avenues that, that students are looking at. And so I think the two overriding themes that I would use to describe the job market right now are robust 
and fragmented. And so, and in some ways it probably seems like those, those words are a little bit kind of in contrast to each other. And so our role in the Career Center is really to teach and equip students um, to be successful in that robust and fragmented market. Um, and so um, I thought what I might do is talk with you a little bit about what we've done so far with our first year students. Um, because obviously if you join the program next year, and we certainly hope that you do, um, we would work with you um, in, in some of the ways that we are working with first years so far. They've been here about six weeks. Um, and some of the things that we have done um, with them so far is that we've um, taken them through an assessment called StrengthsFinder 2.0, which helps them identify their biggest strengths. Many students are looking to make a career change, and one of the biggest struggles that they often have in making a career change is identifying the transferable skills that they can then articulate to employers in the new field that they're looking to work in. And so we've helped them with that. We've obviously helped them translate their business school admission resume into an MBA level resume. So that's something that we've worked with them on in the last six weeks. We've helped them create a set of tools built around design thinking principles to evaluate career path, uh, career paths of interest. Um, and we do use design thinking in that process so that they can be efficient and effective in that process. Um, we've had them start networking, and we've had them start practicing their networking skills uh, just with each other. We've had small talk workshops, and we've had over 200 of our first year students participate in those small talk workshops with each other so that they can practice that experience. And they've even role played the role of being a recruiter to get the experience of what it feels like to be in, in that role and so that they can improve their own skills before the real recruiting experience begins. We've given them an interview survival kit so that they can effectively answer the most common MBA interview questions, even if they start the recruiting process very early. We've started our one-on-one -on -one appointments. We have started some of our industry and job function specific workshops. Uh, and we have started uh, equipping students to navigate the on-campus recruiting process. We have introduced students to their career fellows who are second years, who are matched with first years to help coach them through the process. And we are starting this week to equip students uh, on their custom search, which is to engage with students who do not come on campus. Um, and again, we call that the custom search. And that's just in the last six weeks. Um, and so we will continue um, over the fall through our management communications course um, to teach our students, to prep them one-on-one, -on -one, to work with our clubs, to work with our coaches, to hone in on those skills, and to help get them ready for the interview processes that will start into the spring and, and get them ready for that internship recruiting process. And happy to answer uh, more of those questions um, as, as you have questions about that. Wonderful, thank you so much, Cheryl. So, you guys have been very busy while we've been up here speaking. <laughs> Lots of questions, which I love to see. So let's dive right, right in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to combine a couple of questions. I've been kind of scrolling through. So, Bill, I think this is an appropriate one for you. Can you talk a little bit about kind of global mobility, the importance of having global talent, and, um, and the U.S. businesses, U.S. schools' role in encouraging more of that in light of some of the challenges around immigration? And then on top of that layer in What's the value of STEM as it pertains to an MBA degree, and how have we positioned okay. ourselves well? These are two separate questions I'm combining. Okay, <laughs> so uh, so the the question of global mobility, uh, we are we're living in a very very interesting time, and when I talked about this notion of polarization and and uh, fragmentation, we're living in a world now of increasing nationalism and essentially a retreat from globalism. And the ironic thing about this, uh, this pursuit of nationalism is that it's creating barriers to global mobility of talent, uh, global mobility of goods and services that actually have the unintended consequence of harming those nations. In particular, uh, I'm involved in an initiative which in my role as 
uh, chairman of the board of the uh, global management, um, the Graduate Management Admission Council, sorry, <laughs> not global, <laughs> but it is a global organization, and um, where we, we are producing uh, evidence that suggests that uh, talent mobility is a critical factor in terms of robust economic activity in any nation around the world. And in fact, what we know from, from years of evidence is that skilled immigration is job creating for people in that, in that country that welcomes people from outside. And so whether or not you are motivated by a sense of you just want to be a welcoming, warm person and welcome talent from all over, or you're very pragmatic and you say, I just want, I want this economy to be better and stronger, the reality is that we should be welcoming talent um, in, into this country and into countries all around the world. The mobility is just profoundly important. What we have done in response to that is that we have created uh, a, an option in our MBA program that is relevant in at least two different ways. Um, the option I'm talking about is this STEM track within the MBA program, what we call M-STEM, if you want to follow up and, and look at the details. Um, so in this country, STEM is a magic word. And STEM is a magic word, number one, because this is where so many jobs are being created. And in fact, one thing that we know is that literally millions of jobs in the STEM space are going unfilled right now because of our policies that are keeping people out uh, uh, and disconnected from these opportunities from other parts of the world. Uh, but STEM, as I mentioned before, is a really important part of an MBA education. You have to be, and I'll I should probably say STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, and uh, business is in the middle of all those things because business activity is connected to those different domains. Uh, and especially in the technology domain, we're highly relevant. And so we are giving you an option to be more connected to the space where you're seeing the most job growth, where there's the most economic opportunity to innovate, to drive entrepreneurial activity, and to have the skills to better understand the space to make you more relevant and capable of operating in that technology space. And when I say technology, I don't mean the tech sector, but the fact that technology is reshaping every industry sector. So we give you the benefit of making yourself more capable, more relevant, but STEM is also a magic word in this country because if the government deems that your program is STEM qualifying, then what that does is with your student visa, it gives you a minimum of three years of work opportunity in this country with your student visa without having to literally win the lottery, the H-1B lottery, in order to stay here and work. And so uh, we feel like we have done uh, our part in terms of encouraging student mobility in terms of increasing opportunity for the students that will join us, and then also increasing opportunity for robust economic activity um, in this country um, after, after you graduate and go join uh, a workforce and do interesting, important things that create value for others. So that's, that's my answer. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to combine and ask maybe Russ or Steve. So there have been a couple of questions that have come in around the new curriculum. One is, how does it integrate the opportunity for alumni and students to connect with each other? Or just in general, not perhaps our new curriculum, but just in general, how do we facilitate that? Um, a, a, an, added, an, add, an addition to that would be, um, will you be taking feedback? You know, if so, how would someone who's part of the inaugural class be able to provide feedback in terms of their experience with the new curriculum. And then this is something that I think just to clarify, you know, how does Team, they ask, how does Team Fuqua get incorporated into the curriculum? And I think it's, there's a way to clarify that it's really a part of the experience. And so maybe the two of you could tackle That's that. all one question. I, well, it's, it's, <laughs> no, it's actually it's like three questions. questions. Right, so. it's like three questions and I'm trying to- in 30 kind of, seconds or less. Right, I'm trying to combine these yeah, things. Sure. So uh, let, let me take the second piece of that yeah. first and then we'll loop in the other two together. Yeah. And so um, 
one thing that I'm really proud that we do is, is we continuously solicit feedback. And um, I, I mentioned before that we talked to a lot of stakeholders as we thought about what we're doing with the new curriculum. And um, last spring, Bill, Steve, and I met with, just with current students, um, 18 different focus groups of between five and eight students. And so we invested a lot of our time because it was critical to know what was their experience to date um, with our curriculum. Um, and, um, and then to begin to talk about some of the things that we were thinking about and have it shape um, in many ways kind of where we ended up. And so uh, we would love feedback. And so um, not only um, is there a, a path to giving us the feedback, but we're going to invite your feedback. And so it's going to be important for us to understand what your experience is as we go through this. Um, as we talk about alumni connecting to, to current students and then what I take as kind of our overall culture and the context for the experience that you have, um, I think what you'll find is because of that latter piece, the culture that we have and the context that you go through here, the things that Steve talked about in terms of the, the support that, that you feel that comes through um, Team Fuqua and the paired principals, uh, our alumni are so engaged. I have to believe we've got the most activated uh, alumni group that's willing to give their time, to be responsive when you have questions, to come back on campus. Uh, when we invite them to. Um, there'll be some admissions weekends where we invite a number of, of alumni back to spend time with prospective students. And, and um, we, we, uh, we typically have too many people that want to come back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so one thing I personally love is, is that engagement. It's fantastic. Um, you know, walking through Fuqua yesterday, uh, randomly saw a couple of alumni uh, from 2013. And so we got to spend some time uh, talking with them. So we've got a really engaged alumni base. I think part of it is because um, just the overall context um, that really is Team Fuqua and what Steve spoke to um, just is throughout the curriculum. So the teamwork that you see, the idea of collaborative leadership connects directly with Team Fuqua, which connects directly with common purpose. And so these things are all interconnected. And so I should probably give Steve a few minutes. Uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> I, mean I, I think to, to follow up specifically on the feedback piece and the accessibility and engagement piece, I think all, all of us have judged some panel at some point. Um, uh, we, we are very connected with our students. We're very accessible. FUQA is very informal. I mean, we're all on a first name basis. This is family. It just, I have two, two young girls in my family, and just uh, last weekend I brought my two daughters to an Association of Women in Business event. And I mean, how special for me to have that intersection between my family, my FUQA family. I want to freeze them in time because they're six and four and they're so <laughs> precious, but I also want them to learn from the incredible role models we have in this community. And that, has been typical for all of us. Sherry, Sherry was at the event with me. Yeah. And so um, all of us, including Bill, while he travels around the world, is in Durham every week to engage with our students, whether it's drinks with the deans or doing deans forums. We, we want to get better. We want to be better. Mm -hmm. So let me talk, ask a question. Um, keeping an eye out on the global macroeconomic trends that are happening, um, what do we do in terms of um, providing our students? Let's see, what is it? Uh, how does the Daytime MBA enable its students to still be resilient and successful even in the midst of tough economic times? And maybe you could talk a little bit. At the, I'm going to direct this to Cheryl, but anyone can, sure. can, can chime in around um, ways in which they're, you're supportive in this process. Okay. Um, I'll address that really at, at two levels. One is in terms of kind of how we think about the job search um, in that I think our overall approach to working with students is that we want them to be capable and confident. Um, kind of in their customized or personalized search, and that for each student, they're going to approach their search a little bit differently um, because their interests are unique. And so um, we do everything that we teach them, um, and so everything that I talked with you about that we've taken them through so far, which is in that summer institute period, um, really is applied in a custom search. And so even if something were to happen where on-campus recruiting were to be no more, which obviously it, it, it's not right now, and, and we don't anticipate that it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, but that those principles apply for students who are looking to work at companies that don't come through on-campus recruiting. And so we're actually already doing that. We're already equipping students to work at or to to find work at companies that don't come on campus. And in fact, one of the assignments that we have through these activities that we take students through is to conduct an informational interview with someone 
who doesn't work at a company on campus. So that's like one very tactical application of that because it's very different to reach out to an alum who's at a company that's not kind of within that Fuqua campus kind of ecosphere, so to speak. And so that's one way, even if your unique list of companies happens to already all be on campus, we're going to ask you for that one moment in time to get an experience while you're here to get that experience of thinking about what's it like to think about a company that doesn't already recruit on campus. And so we're exposing you to that as a first year student, regardless of what your interests are. Mm -hmm. Can I, can yeah. I jump in? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there's, th I think this is really a great question. It is a great question. Uh, because there's a, there's a saying, a rising tide floats all boats. Yes. But all of you over the course of your careers will face situations where that, that tide is going out and you're grounded in some way. And, um, and the reality is all of you will have to learn how to lead effectively, not just in the good times, but the bad times. And, um, and so I think that that's a, a really, really important capability to, to build in and as a consequence, will prepare you to be able to make the kinds of commitments when times are tough that will advance the interests of, of your organization. Part of what we will do in addition to the, the kind of the formal aspects of the curriculum and the, the career development activities and so on, is we're going to give you too much to do. And, and the reason why I think that's critically important is it's going to force you to really do the self-exploration, uh, create the self-awareness around what really matters to you, what makes you passionate, mm -hmm. and therefore um, allows you to see when times get tough, where is it that you want to double down? What is it that you care about? Where are you going to have the passion that's going to give you the resilience to make it through those tough times? And so kind of discovering that authenticity yes. Uh, is extremely important as opposed to just saying, you know, I'm going to go into consulting because everybody's going into consulting, or I'm going to go to Silicon Valley because so many people are going to Silicon Valley. And, and in fact, most of our graduates these days do seem to gravitate to the West Coast. But uh, we want to make sure that you're prepared to authentically know who you are, follow your passion, and therefore be prepared to succeed when those tough times arrive. I, I would just quickly add on, I, I think one of the things that's really neat about watching the career process unfold at Fuqua is the way in which the paired principles that Steve introduced plays out in the career process. And so authentic engagement is that we really do want students to be honest with themselves about what do they find meaningful, what do they get excited about. Um, so exactly what Bill talked about, and, and loyal community comes into play there, is you may have someone who contacts you about a job opportunity, but it's not of interest to you. So what's the best thing that you as a steward of the Fuqua brand could do? Well, I know this friend. I have this friend, Bill, who I think would be a great fit for this job. Can I refer you? And so that, that community really comes into play. And so it's, it's really wonderful to see it play out in what you would what you might think is actually a very selfish process and it's really it's really not so it's great to see it play out so sherry i know you get want to go to the next question but no go ahead 30 no, seconds this is here. awesome so, um, okay. I, I think the other complement to this are some things that that steve and i've been working on with others um, over the last couple of years and so we've uh, very intentionally launched um, uh, an initiative with the uh, director of sports psychology and leader development in the athletic mm -hmm. department at, at duke and so we're so fortunate to have a university that has robust resources. And so um, in a number of areas, we've tried to, to access those resources. And, and this individual has come in and talked about the importance of, of vulnerability and with respect to courage, um, but the idea that um, you do wanna take some risks. You do wanna put yourself out there. You do wanna be authentic and, and, and um, really go after what it is that, that you're passionate about as opposed to preserving and trying to protect yourself. And, so in the same way that um, he might have worked with Daniel Jones or Zion Williamson uh, last year, uh, the idea that you're going to you're going to face pressure, you're going to get feedback sometimes that 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 may feel damaging, but it's constructive. And so how do you use that in a positive sense? And so all of these things I think are complementary to each other. Um, and what we're trying to do is just uh, enable you a little bit more to then be activated around uh, taking some risk and being courageous in what you do, but then also getting feedback and learning and using it constructively. 
Okay. So we had a, a couple of questions that focus around social entrepreneurship, um, uh, experiential learning, social impact as it relates to some of the themes that we've talked about today in the curriculum. Anyone want to tackle what are the opportunities for someone who's interested in this space and how do we feel like we differentiate ourselves? Yeah, I would say these are endless. I mean, um, <laughs> but one that is relevant and coming to mind because I'm interviewing for it and I did this when I was a student, we have an incredible program called Fuqua On Board, mm -hmm. which fills a lot of a lot of kind of checks in that, that yeah, question. Um, and, and, you know, we could talk about our centers, we could talk about our curriculum, but let me just focus on something special like Fuqua On Board. Um, it is this combination of of learning, of uh, experiential engagement with Durham. And so a lot of um, you know, 40 plus uh, nonprofits that are doing wonderful things to support the community have engaged with us here at Fuqua um, to partner with our students that get to sit on those boards and help them um, navigate those decisions, help our students learn. Uh, many of the students that come to our community have a vision of sitting on a board at some point. And so um, to me, it's the most um, immediate answer to that question, the most specific um, and one that you all might not be aware of. I mean, you can read about Case on our website, you can read through our student blogs. Um, uh, for Fuqua on board, it, it not only helps our students, it helps the community tremendously. Yeah, yeah I'd just add to that, that um, I talked a little bit about the general curriculum and some innovation that we have there, but take a look on the website and you'll see that you get to add to this general curriculum in a way that's meaningful to you. And that could be in social impact area, it could be in health sector management. It could be an energy, it could be an entrepreneurship. And so there's lots of different areas where you can say, this is what I want to, to go deep into. And so um, the largest club that we have on a co-curricular basis is actually the Net Impact. Um, we have um, uh, probably one of the most robust offerings in impact investing. And, and so, um, and, and I think we are um, clearly one of the leaders in health sector management. And so just encourage you to, to take a look and see what we have out there. And um, as Steve mentioned, I think any of us are happy to take uh, additional questions outside even this context and talk more about that. So I'm going to um, continue with this theme. I always talk about the fact that this is a very student-led or student-driven culture. And so there are a couple of questions that came in that really talk about, okay, if I, you know, if I have an idea for a company that, you know, that I'd love to have be a part of the FCC, the Fuqua Client Consulting Project um, list, can I propose a company? As well as, um, same thing on the lines of a new club. If I have a passion for something, can I create new clubs? So what's the uh, ability to have creation, create a right <laughs> as a student here across these different dimensions. Yeah. Can we go? Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, we encourage it. And so yeah, things like absolutely. FCCP, uh, we love the fact that whether it's current students, alums, even prospective students mm -hmm. might say, uh, there's a huge opportunity here to, 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 to bring in a new organization. And so um, that happens now. We've been very fortunate to have some relationships come our way because students have said, um, not only am I interested in this particular you know, area of media and entertainment, but I actually have a connection with this company if you, Fuqua, want to reach out to, to them. So, so we love that. Um, new clubs, so we partner, and Steve does this more than I do, with um, our student government. And so the student, we have a fantastic student government that we work extremely closely with. And so we have over 60 clubs. Um, any given year, you might see uh, a couple go and a couple come, depending on how motivated uh, the, the current student leadership is. And so um, I would say, absolutely, if you have an idea for a club and it's more than you that's interested in that club, um, then, then typically um, we'll help support that. The student government will help support that. And we'll try and, and, and get it embedded in, in what we do here. And, and to double down on it, to, to me, this is really experiential learning. This is where you take what you learn in the classroom and managing your first year team dynamic and the mentorship you get from second years to me, that's what's really, truly special about this place. Each, each first year academic team will be paired with a, a second year mentor, a Cole fellow. And, mm -hmm. and that, again, that, that culture that I mentioned from orientation with second years coming back, this is a community that takes care of itself. And I think often in clubs and in the co-curricular, that's where students experiment with their own personal leadership dynamic. And um, not all of them are home runs. You know, not always is that successful. Mm -hmm. And that's important to learn in this really safe environment uh, about failure, about making the wrong decision and about elevating the experience of your peers without influence. You know, you're all peer to peers. And for us as staff, we get to learn. You know, we, we hopefully retain that institutional intelligence so clubs are able to improve every year upon mistakes or successes. Um, but I, I didn't expect in this role how often I would be inspired. Uh, our students are truly unique in that respect.
So, so Sherry is really quick, and so she moved on to the next question before I could ask that previous question. So I'm going to go backwards. Uh, my apologies to everybody, but um, this question about social entrepreneurship and social impact, is, it's a really, really interesting, important question, and certainly we have incredible depth and breadth for people with specific interests in social entrepreneurship or working in the nonprofit space, the B Corp space, and so on. But I also want to call attention to the reality that social impact is something that every business now needs to consider, and that's behind the kind of the relevance of this new course that looks at capitalism uh, and common purpose in a world of difference, which is as soon as we announced that, uh, there was this letter from the business roundtable saying we're no longer driven by maximizing shareholder value, we have to think about stakeholder value, and there are a bunch of very complicated questions that big organizations in the traditional for-profit space have to consider. You know, Walmart decides to take ammunition off their shelves. That's going to be a huge financial hit for them. CVS decides to take out tobacco products from their shelves, a huge financial hit. The U.S. auto industry is struggling with, do they stick to auto emission standards or do they uh, do they allow uh, them to go to more permissive standards that are now legally possible? These are questions that everybody has to address. And I'm a big believer in capitalism. Hopefully you will understand that. As a dean of the business school, I believe in capitalism. But we also have to understand for capitalism to live up to its potential, we have to recognize there will be times when we are asked to do things, asked to consider things that have a social impact dimension. And we're going to have to understand how we will think through those questions. And we believe all of you need to be prepared to deal with those questions. So apologies for going backwards. No, this is great because it's a great segue to, there's a couple of questions here that really focus on your um, the, the topic around leadership. And one was really interesting, you know, the, the question around is leadership a learned behavior or is it something that someone already possesses? Just more kind of thoughts around yeah. that. And then there was one around with the mention of IQ, EQ, and DQ, uh, what advice would you give someone who doesn't easily exhibit EQ? Hmm. So, uh, the, taking the, the last one first, and um, I think we're supposed to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the you know EQ EQ doesn't mean that you are you know constantly getting in people's faces and and that you're just an extreme extrovert. That that people can be more on the introverted side, but have good emotional intelligence, have the ability to read how other people are feeling and to respond appropriately. Um, but, but it's an area where I think you can develop those capabilities. And so that leads me to the second thing, which is this question of, is leader, are you born a leader or do you develop as a leader? Very tricky question. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is there's some degree of both. And uh, as an example, um, we, we pretty much believe that by the time you're applying to an MBA program, at that age, your decency is fairly well established. You either care about other people or you don't. You're either selfish or selfless. Um, and so we're looking for evidence of this underlying capability. Having said that, we don't believe that everyone is fully developed in their emotional intelligence, their their decency and their ability to think through what is decent in a particular situation, or even their, their IQ, that all of us have the ability to learn, develop, and grow. And so we believe that there are certain building blocks or foundations that help you grow and transform and, and contribute to others. Um, and so there is this mixture of there's some stuff that we think you need to bring to the party and other stuff that you will bring and learn that will make that party more interesting. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's a great note to end things. Yes. I want to thank all of my colleagues. Um, you guys are great to work with, let alone be on a panel with. So I hope you've enjoyed <laughs> it. I know I have. Um, and thank you to all of you out there. I know that it's either morning or noon or night for some of you. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation, the dialogue. You have wonderful questions. I know we didn't get a chance to get to all of them. So I will commit to trying to answer these and see, see if there's a way for us to get those back out to you at a later date.